we've just looked at the general form of the graph of a polynomial function. And we saw it was kind of quite complicated. It depended very much on the degree, um, if it was odd, if it was even, how large it was. Um, and really the conclusion we came to was that there's a lot of variation in the potential properties of a polynomial function. But there are certain things we can say. So what I'm going to do now is just summarize some of kind of the general properties of polynomial functions that are worth knowing. Properties of general polynomial functions. So just to remind us, by general polynomial function, what I mean is a function of the form. So I need a little bit of space here. A function of the form a0 plus a1x plus dot 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 up to a n x to the n, where x is the variable, of course, and the a0 up to a n are constants, called the coefficients. Okay, so let's go through our kind of core properties we've been looking at. So as always, I'm going to do kind of the general property on the right-hand side. And on the, sorry, on the left-hand side, on the right, I'll do kind of examples or justifications. So let me just make sure we've got this all the way down so I don't have to do it over and over again. Okay, first of all, domain. Well, this is very straightforward. Everything. The domain, of course, is everything because all we are doing is just adding and multiplying numbers. And we can do that for anything. A polynomial expression makes sense for any x at all. Next, okay. Range, well, we definitely know this is more complicated. So I'm gonna break this up into kind of two cases and just talk broadly about what happens. So the range, first of all, if n is odd, it's quite simple. So if n is an odd number, So not an odd function. Remember, kind of, there's two different meanings to odd. One is an odd whole number. The other is an odd function. So then it's an odd number. Then the range is everything. That's pretty nice to know. On the other hand, if n is an even number, well, it's not the whole thing. That's definitely true. But it could be bounded below or above, depending on the sign of a n. So I'm going to break this into two possibilities. So let's get a bit smaller so it's easy to write down. So if a n is greater than naught, and if a n is less than naught. These are two situations I want to deal with. So if it's greater than naught, it's a little bit like a quadratic equation in the sense that that's the vague shape and a parabola is bounded below but not above so it's going to look like it's going to be closed interval some constant k onwards whereas if it's negative well it's kind of like an upside down u at least in the quadratic case and then it's bounded above by some constant i'll call it l just so i don't confuse it with a k And the thing about these L and these K is they're difficult to calculate in general. We can do it for quadratics, but in general it's not so easy. These are hard to calculate, hard to find constants. So let me just draw a couple of pictures to make sure we really understand why this is going on. So we'll do y here, of course, and then x. So let me do two of them, one odd, one even. 
So in the even case, sorry, I'll do odd first maybe. In the odd case, you end up with something that looks like this. Wiggle like that, that's really bad. <laughs> this kind of thing. Really bad again, let's make it a bit more reasonable. This is kind of what the odd looks like. So the range, you can just immediately see, right? The range is the entire thing. Every single Y value is hit. So the range is everything. Whereas if you have something of an even degree, well, then it looks a little bit different. So let's assume that AN is negative and you're even. Then it could look like this. It's a bit of a bad one because it's violating the vertical line test, but something like this. So in this case, we are a and negative. The degree is even, and you can see the range isn't. It's not whatever you want it to be, right? So it's at the very top. So it's the negative. So in this case, if this was our notation from. The left hand side, your or L would be here. Okay, just to give you a feeling for what's going on. Right, so domain, very straightforward, range significantly more difficult. We know for quadratic equations we could put it in vertex form and read off the the range fairly easily, but not so easy. And they're always unbounded uh, overall because they always can get huge in either the positive or negative direction. Sometimes both, if you're an odd degree, but overall you're unbounded. So always unbounded. So there's some direction that you can get massive in. Okay, so range complicated, domain easy. Next, uh, well, symmetry. So we've talked about this a bunch already, but I'll just remind us. F is odd. F is an odd function. So the shortcut here, and this is only a shortcut for polynomials, all exponents are odd numbers. This is kind of where the notation comes from. All exponents of x are odd numbers. This causes problems for a lot of people because they don't realize that the concept of an odd function is much more general than the concept of an, a polynomial with odd degree powers or odd, odd number exponents. So uh, an odd function is much, much more general, right? It's any function which has a graph which has the symmetry when I rotate it around by 108 degrees around the origin. But if you're a polynomial, then you can be spotted. You can spot if it's odd just by looking at the exponents. And the same thing is true of even. So my polynomial is even, if and only if you guessed that all exponents are even numbers. So just as a quick collection of examples, if f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, this is x squared plus x to the 0, 0 and 2 are even, they're both divisible by 2, even. It's an even function. However, let's just get this right. If f of x is equal to x squared plus x, this is x squared plus x to the 1 if you want. And now this is a mixture of two of them. So this is even and this is odd. So it's not in either of these camps. camps. So it's neither even nor odd. Neither odd nor even. So important to understand it's much more it's much more restrictive than just the degree okay so let's think about zeros i think this is the only other thing that we can say anything about reasonably comprehensively increasing and decreasing it's such a free-for-all because of the nature of the graphs just looking at these examples i mean you're sometimes increasing, sometimes decreasing, depending on what interval you're on. So it's really, it's really a nightmare. Um, 
So let's think about zeros a little bit. So zeros is a very interesting topic. Like I said, it's, it's a topic, in the previous video I said it's a topic that people have been thinking about for thousands of years. Greek mathematicians thought about this. So if f is degree n, what's true is f has f has n or fewer real zeros. Okay. So if you're a degree n polynomial, you could have no more than n distinct zeros. You could have less, of course, and you could have none. But it's worth pointing out how to visualize this. This is basically, remember what a zero is, it can be interpreted in the graph as a cross point or a point where you touch the x-axis as an x-intercept. So the graph of y is equal to f of x has between zero, zero and n x intercepts. That's what this is saying. So let's just do a few examples. Let's do one of each. In fact, do I need to do this? Yes, I'll do. I'll do it. Okay. So I'll do. I'll do cubics just to show that you can have zero. You can have one. You can have two. Actually, I'll do cubics and show you can have one, two, or three. And we actually did this at the beginning of the last video, but let's do it again. This guy is equal to well. When you factor it completely, you end up getting this. There's a difference of two squares in there, so it's not too bad. This has three real zeros. One, zero, and minus one. If I have f of x is equal to x squared, we'll do plus, sorry, x cubed, plus x squared. Well, this can be factored as x squared times x plus 1. So this has two real zeros. I'm saying real zeros here because there is a theory of complex zeros. If we introduce the complex numbers, but that's something that we don't want to do in this course. It's something for a more sophisticated course. So real zeros, possibilities are 0 and minus 1, so 2. Finally, we could just have 1. Um, f of x is equal to, I don't know, let's do the following, x cubed plus x. So you can factor out 1x, but then you've got x squared plus 1, and x squared plus 1 can't be 0 because it's always got to be greater than or equal to 1. So this has one real 0. So this is an example. If you were doing complex numbers, there'd be more zeros, but we aren't. has only one real 0, namely 0. So let's look at some of these examples. We've already seen them above. Right? These were the first examples we did, so let me scroll back up here. See this example? This is visible, I'm crossing at three points. Then this example, I'm crossing at exactly two points. And the other one, the last one, it would only cross at once, a little bit like these examples at the top here. Now, I think it's worth maybe pointing out a few things here about kind of the general story. But maybe before I do that, let me just mention what happens with odd. So there's something special with odd degrees here. So if I have n is odd, that guarantees that there has to be at least one real zero. At least one real zero. Now we know this because the range of an odd degree polynomial is the entire number line, right? So that means zero has to get hit somewhere. But this is not true. So I'll draw a picture in a second, but this is it's important to understand this is not true. Not true for even. And even. So e.g. If I took x squared, or f of x, is equal to x squared plus 1. Just like I said a moment ago, that's not equal to 0. That's not equal to 0. 
ever because it's always greater than or equal to one. So there's no hope. So let's draw a picture just to make sure we understand why this is true for odds. And then I'll kind of also talk a bit more broadly about why the degree n business is true. So let's do something which has the format. I don't know if some, I don't know. Let's just see what I come up with when I draw this. Okay. So this is some potential graph of some polynomial function, all right? And we can see here, it doesn't matter. So this is this looks kind of like a what? It looks like a generic, is it degree seven? One turn, two turn, three turn, four turn, five turn, six turns. So six turns, remember it's n minus one turns is the max. So this looks like kind of a, um, a maximal turn degree seven polynomial. All right, so a maximal turn degree seven polynomial, and this guy, just observe from what I'm about to say, if I move it up and down, doesn't matter where I move it, I'm always gonna have to cross somewhere. That's the basic reason for odds you have to cross. Also, we can see why we have at most seven roots here. If I move this kind of generic looking graph for degree seven, or a maximal turn degree graph for degree seven is a better way to put it. What's the most crossings I could get? Well, as I come down here, this is kind of the max. And if you think about that, where does that happen? That has to happen four, five, six, seven. So you can kind of see to a large degree geometrically why you're gonna have at most seven turns here, or at most seven zeros, because if you've got six turns, you can only cross it at most seven times. So, these are kind of a couple of things to keep in mind. So it's a nice way to kind of remember things, but this is just a good example of, I'm only crossing at least once, but it has to happen. So must cross once. So must intersect X axis somewhere, which corresponds to a real zero. So the last thing I want to say about this, of course, is about factorization. So in general, finding zeros, so as I've said before, there's no fancy quadratic equation for a general polynomial. That's actually a really deep fact. And there's no quadratic equation or version of a quadratic equation. So that means finding zeros is terribly difficult. And the only real method is factorization. So splitting it up into smaller and smaller pieces and trying to find zeros for those. So ideally what you'd do is you'd factor it into linear pieces and then to read things off. But that's really, really, really difficult in general. It's even more difficult than factoring big numbers into prime numbers, which is already extremely challenging. It's worse. So just as a warning, finding zeros, I mean, really is about factorizing. is about kind of factorizing into linear pieces. Factorizing into linears. If you can find a zero that allows you to split off a linear factor. So if you if alpha is a zero, you can split off x minus alpha. And that's kind of a nice fact. The problem is this is mind-blowingly difficult as I said. So this is very hard in general very difficult in general really really difficult so as an example if I just make a totally random choice of degree 7 polynomial now back at high school it maybe was something you were given so factor this potentially but those problems were always ridiculously pre-baked in the sense that you probably were able to find a root of this or a zero of this, which was a, an integer. So one, two, three, four, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. And then you could use long division to factor out. And that's all well and good, but you've got to know what the zero is ahead of time. You've got to have spotted your, your zero. And if you can't spot any zeros, you can't do it. So that the 
way that you'll have factored polynomials at high school potentially it won't have happened with everyone but if you have factored bigger polynomials they'll always be an incredibly pre pre-baked right they'll have been deliberately chosen so you don't have any issues so it's important you understand that's an incredible special case the types of problems so for this guy i've just chosen it at random i can't see any zeros of this i have no idea how to factor this thing at all so no obvious way to factor I'm sure there are very elaborate algorithms, but they're very, very difficult. They're very difficult and will involve sophisticated mathematics, much more sophisticated than anything you'll have seen before. Certainly significantly more sophisticated than anything in high school. So the thing about this is, in theory, it's great. Finding zeros is the same thing as kind of factoring into linears, but it's going to be impossible in general. In the same way that if I give you a whole number with a million digits and I say mul write this down as a product of prime numbers what are you going to do right it's a nightmare you could try just going through them is it divisible by one well yes of course that's irrelevant is it divisible by two yes no is it divisible by three yes no is it divisible by four yes no so you could do that but it's going to take a huge amount of time if you have a million digits so actually that the fact that it's so hard to factor numbers there is the kind of <laughs> I don't need to go off a tangent but it's the um, the bedrock of well the, the way all encryption works in the world really not all encryption but a lot of encryption the fact that it's impossible to break numbers into products of primes easily is, is kind of the reason we're able to encrypt so much information which sounds completely beyond belief but it's true it's called the rsa encryption look it up anyway i'm <laughs> going off on a tangent the main thing is finding zeros of polynomials really difficult in general we maybe know in the abstract there might be a zero somewhere because maybe you're odd, but finding it could be computationally impossible, basically. And again, even there's no guarantee, and that really is because of the shape, this type of thing, right? So that's an even kind of shape, and that doesn't cross because you turn around. Okay, so there we go. That's the kind of the general things that we can say about polynomials.